If you tell anyone, I'll kill you and I'll kill your family. These were the first words he said to me when I was eight years old. One in six. That's the number of men globally who have been sexually assaulted and abused. I am one of them. I am here to tell you my story and to change the narrative. For it's a narrative that continues to define too many men in the world. The aftermath of abuse doesn't end as many people want to believe when our abuser leaves our lives. To move from victim to victor is the ultimate victory. And we do so by making one powerful decision. We break up with our abuser. If we can shift the men's sexual abuse paradigm, create a new conversation rooted in hope and power, and save the lives of thousands of men just like me, just like you, imagine how the world would respond. Now this is how we break up with our abuser. This is how we break the cycle. This is the power of one. When I was eight years old, my sister and I went to the local swimming pool. And at the end of the day, a man followed me into the change rooms and raped me in the shower. The first thing he said to me was that if I tell anyone, he'll kill me and my family. Now, I grew up in Queenie, a small town just outside of Canberra, the capital of Australia. And this man knew where to find me, and he continued to abuse me, to groom me, and to manipulate me. And in a somewhat unfathomable way, I thought I fell into a relationship with him that some might call Stockholm Syndrome. Now, I felt love for this man, the same man who hurt and abused me. And I fell to the point where at eight years old, I would ride my bike to his house and wait outside for him, knowing all too well the horrible fate that awaited me. And this went on for five years. Just before my 13th birthday, he abandoned me. He disappeared out of my life. And for two years, I questioned who I was, what I was, and where I belonged in the world. At 15 years old, I started sneaking into gay cruise lounges and sex clubs. And in a recapitulating theme, I let these men abuse me, and then I was violent with them. I would beat them up and rob them. I abused them as I had been abused, in an unconscious repetition of revenge and betrayal. In identifying with my abuser, I thought I was getting my power back, feeling alive again. It was my FU to the world. Now this was happening as I was trying to be in healthy relationships with females. My addiction to alcohol and drugs had begun and my depression deepened. I pushed away from family and friends and I, I lived the life of an imposter, a sullen and angry actor who thought, he was, who thought he was charming his way through society. You know, in a world of, of seemingly happy and healthy people, I thought I was the only one who was lost and confused. Eventually, I moved to New York to study and become a professional actor, hoping to get away from my past and to start a new life. But I quickly fell back into my post-trauma behaviours. I fell in with the wrong crowd, started in on heavier drugs like heroin and crack cocaine. I started selling my body for sex with men and struggled daily with suicidal ideations. To the point where I attempted suicide. Now I lived the life of an emotionally abandoned, self-loathing man. And then, and then I told someone. I opened my heart and poured everything out in the presence of my best friend. After 25 years of silent suffering, I finally spoke my truth. And the greatest turning point in my healing journey came when I was in, in group therapy. And my therapist asked us all to talk about something we were proud of. You know, something we had achieved. And I fell to tears right away, knowing 
that there was absolutely nothing I was proud of. Absolutely nothing in my 32 years of existence that I achieved. And then a fellow group member leaned in and whispered to me, Nathan, you are here. This is what you should be proud of. And suddenly I realized that showing up is what mattered most. Yes, we talk about the incident and many more talk about the successful resolutions. But few, if any, talk about the mess in between. Why? Because too many men can't face the reality that sexual abuse can and does happen to us. And this is due to shame, judgment, toxic masculinity, or simply a fragile or hurt ego trying to protect them. So breaking up with our abuser doesn't end when we say goodbye or simply by walking away. So let's go over the steps I took to break up with my abuser. And may they be a roadmap for others. One, anger and hatred leads to forgiveness. Now, anger and hatred are two demons I lived with all my life. You know, I was angry with and I hated the world. I felt and acted like it owed me something. I hated everyone around me. And I hated myself for who and what I'd become. And it took a lot of inner work to understand, appreciate, and get through these two major emotions. But I did. And we can break up with anger and hatred. And you know, we wrestle with their presence in our lives until we embrace them and we learn what they came to teach. For they came to teach about forgiveness. Now, only once we managed to forgive ourselves for what was done to us and not by us and understand the virtue of forgiving those who have hurt us the most, can we disempower the demons of anger and hate that have controlled us? We will see life and its people in a new light. The light of mercy. But if we don't find forgiveness, we will continue to live in the cycle of anger and hate. This is forgiveness. Two, imposter syndrome and self-sabotage leads to acceptance. If you could go back and speak to your childhood self, what would you tell them? Now, for most of us, the answer is, it wasn't your fault. Now, I lived my life with the unrelenting belief that I was to blame for my abuse, that I don't deserve love, that peace and joy were not mine to have. I sabotaged everything good in my life. You know, who am I to talk about this? I would tell myself. What do I know? Why should I be the one? But once I realized that my childhood trauma was not my fault and I accepted everything I'd been through in my life, a huge weight was lifted off my shoulders. I was finally able to understand my relationship with my abuser, with my family, with friends and lovers. Now, in honoring who we truly are, and letting go of the need for an imposter. We discover that we are powerful beyond belief and nothing can stop us. This is acceptance. Three, shame and ego leads to confidence. Take ownership of everything you are and everything you have done, the good, the bad, the ugly, now I gained a powerful sense of freedom and self-worth. The voices in my head were silenced and I was finally able to love and accept myself for the very first time. Now I am not a perfect human, far from it. And none of us are. We are not made to be perfect. However, we have to work hard at taking control, accepting ourselves and freeing ourselves from the, the shame and ego that swell from deep within. Not only then will we evolve into higher and stronger people and we realise that we had the power all along. This 
is confidence. Four, toxic masculinity leads to vulnerability. Cry. <laughs> A recent study done on the tears we shed from shame, anger, hatred, sorrow, depression, revealed that there are enough toxins and poisons in these tears to kill a rat. So think about that. Think about what that does to us as humans when we hold our tears inside. So I say to you, feel your pain. Show your vulnerability. Share the darkest secret of your life. Cry and end the stigma that men don't cry. Yeah. <laughs> Toxic masculinity is the outgrowth of men being groomed into believing that vulnerability is bad, it's weak, and it's not manly. Now, this is wrong and it's untrue. It is okay not to be okay. And more importantly, it is okay to show that you are not okay. This is vulnerability. Five, unworthiness and fear leads to worthiness. Breathe. Take back your power. Now write a letter to your abuser and to your traumas telling them that they do not own you anymore, that you are free from them, you are strong, you are thriving, and you are a survivor. And do what you want with the letter. You know, take it to your grave, give it to a loved one, burn it, which is what I did. Keep it on you forever so you can see how far you have come. But once you let go of unworthiness and fear, you discover that you are worthy and you are deserving. And when self-doubt hits deep, see where it hits you on your body and sit with it. Understand what it does to you and how it makes you feel, and then breathe through it. Move forward with it, evolve with it, grow with it. Breathing keeps us safe. It keeps us strong. And it keeps us calm. This is worthiness. Six, addiction and self-harm leads to community. Therapy, rehabilitation programs, and mindfulness techniques gives us a better understanding of addiction and self-harm. Now, we reach out to others, to a higher power or a higher self, and in doing so, we experience the healing effect of community, family, and like-minded people. Connection to others ensures that we do not fall down again. And when speaking about my trauma, I make sure to surround myself with people who love me, who believe me, and who listen to me. Three of the most important words in the English language are undoubtedly, I hear you. So make sure to surround yourself with someone who hears you. This is community. And last but not least, education leads to transformation. Teach. <laughs> you know, we need to educate our children. But in order to do that, we first need to educate ourselves as adults, as leaders, and as a community of thinkers and doers. Otherwise, what's the point? Why are we here? And when we educate ourselves, we open our ears, our hearts and our minds. We drop the prejudice and the fear and we can finally end the narrative and the stigma that surrounds child and male sexual abuse. Now we need to keep 
to keep on having this conversation so that one day the world finally hears us and responds. This is transformation. So let me leave you with this. As the last few lines of my memoir, Toy Cars, is written, it is time we stand up, have the conversation, educate ourselves and each other, and be proud of who we are. And we are no longer victims. We are survivors, and we are here. Freedom is of the mind, not of the body. You know, speaking and living our truth is a powerful thing. And our truth is our power and our ultimate freedom. This is the power of one. Imagine the power of one million. Thank you.